Uh, sorry about that uh, that disturbance uh, in in a, in, a, in a in a stable and prosperous and just Jewish state in the land of Israel, and he says that it's as if God says to us, "If you do these commandments, I will help you in your effort to do them and to achieve perfection in them." Here again, we hear the echo of the perfection of the consciousness cleaving to the true to the true and the good because they are true and good. Um, and I will remove all the obstacles and difficult difficulties which stand in your way. Now, as you read through these promises that Rambam makes, that the Torah will, will give us this prosperous and safe state, um, I think you can reasonably read them in two very different ways. You can read them as supernatural promises that somehow, if you put on tefillin and daven appropriately, then uh, it will rain and uh, the nations of the world will not attack and obliterate us. Um, and the Rambam does hint in various places that that is the case. Um, given the general logic of his system, his thinking, his writings, I tend to assume that he writes those things um, as throwaways for the masses. Um, and most of the time, as here I think is the case, if you read it carefully on 4.13, um, you can read what he says in a totally naturalistic, rational way. That is to say, if you don't pollute the water, you'll have clean water. If you uh, elect the fools to run your country, your country will be run by fools. Um, and so I think he's, yeah, he, you can easily read this, as, these promises as naturalistic promises. Um, and that would be very much in keeping with the Rambam's approach as a whole. Um, now, after this, the Rambam nonetheless defines the various places, uh, what the Garden of Eden is, the Garden of Eden. Uh, he, he doesn't say it's not, it doesn't exist. He says it's some, it actually sounds like sort of like the, Galap the Galapago Islands. It sounds like, you know, uh, um, he says it's some lovely place filled with medicinal fruits and, and uh, exceedingly beautiful plants and life forms. Um, he says Gehenna is the name for the pain and punishment which accompanies the wicked. Um, the days of the Messiah I'll come to in a minute. And then the resurrection of the dead. Now, it says in the Mishnah that if you don't believe in Tchiat uh, Emeti Mina Torah, if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and that the, and that the Torah promises the resurrection of the dead, you don't have a place to, in the world to come. Historically, Maimonides was accused of not believing in the resurrection of the dead, because it's miraculous and supernatural. Um, he says explicitly that he does believe in the resurrection of the dead. And when told that he doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, he wrote a letter called The Letter of the Resurrection of the Dead, where he says, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now, the Ramam also says that you have to say things which aren't true so as not to undermine the beliefs of the masses, because the masses have to believe in certain authority structures and certain, certain ideals. Um, and so it would be perfectly in keeping with the Rambam to say that he believed in the resurrection of the dead when in fact he didn't. Now, I think that is the case. Um, not that I'm necessarily opposed to, the, to, to, the, to any irrational belief. The world doesn't strike me as a particularly rational place. All you have to do is turn on the news. But, um, so, you know, the, rational of the, dead would be, the resurrection of the dead would be par for the course as far as I'm concerned. But um, the Rambam... Uh, I think how does the way he he I, I'm, I'm not sure I could say he, he does this with a sense of humor because to be honest I've spent many years reading many many of the writings of the Rambam and I've never run into anything that I can say with confidence is necessarily a, a, a joke or a sense of humor but what he says about the resurrection of the dead is you have to believe in it and it's a cardinal principle and then he says this is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead there will be a certain number of only only the righteous only, a, only the righteous, only the Jews, uh, only the righteous of the Jews, that is, they will be resurrected, they will then live totally normal lives, and then they will die. And this will happen once, and that's it. And then he doesn't say anything else about it, why it's important, how it fits in with the world to come, what it has to do with intrinsic value and truth and goodness and the purpose of Torah, Nothing. Nothing. All he says is, it's true, they're going to rise up, live a normal lifespan, die, and then that's it. Check. Right? So, I, 
I think it, it's hard not to read it with a little bit of a, a grain of salt. However, in any case, he then goes on to talk about the days of the Messiah. Now, the days of the Messiah, he goes to great length, both here and in the end of the Mishnah Torah, which is where we're going to finish our course, um, to say that the days of the Messiah will not change the laws of nature and no supernatural events will happen. What are the days of the Messiah? The days of the Messiah are the realization of the highest ideals of Torah um, for, for the, not only for the individual who achieves knowledge of God, but for humanity as a whole. And I think, uh, uh, I, I don't want to quote too much of it, we're, we're, it's, we're going a little long here. If you read, to, read again through 415, 416, 417, the Raman describes it beautifully. Um, and basically, the days of the Messiah look like this. The Jews are keeping Torah, and so the individuals of the Jews who are capable of understanding that one should be doing all this out of love, and for the sake of intrinsic value and truth and for no other reward, they're living their thing. And they're getting as close as they can to the state of realized consciousness, which is the this worldly version of the world to come. A consciousness where one is focused completely on truth and value and serving God for its own sake and doing Torah for its own sake. All those things I said were synonymous in the Rambam system. Um, and then one, and we'll see how this works later on, actually passes on from this physical existence into an eternal state of divine spiritual bliss because of that cleaving to true value, and true value is eternal. So we'll see more about that later on as we unpack the Rambam's theory of, of eternal life, his theory of divinity and so forth. Um, but that's what's happening on for, for individuals. The masses are being, among other things, told what they need to hear. They're also following the law if they need to believe this, because otherwise they'll be punished by a furious God. Um, they also believe that if they do everything they're told, then it will rain and they'll be prosperous. In fact, they will be living in a prosperous, safe, beautiful, largely realized society, because everybody will be following the good and rational laws of the Torah. And so they will live in a political entity, the Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael in the land of Israel, with a king that's a righteous king, and that's why he's called the Messiah. I mean, Messiah literally means he has olive oil poured on his head, but, but it, the, um, depending if he's from the house of David. But, but the, what makes him significant is that he's a good leader. He's committed to this constitution. Perhaps he's one of the individuals that, that knows the truth. Certainly he's providing the functions that the masses need from a king. And this has an effect of redeeming not only the individual Jews, but the Jewish nation. And the Rambam envisions this as spreading out into a just world order where all humanity will be, the world will be filled with knowledge of God. Malah ha'aretz de'a et Adonai kemayim liyam mechasim. He quotes from Isaiah, the world will be filled with the knowledge of God like waters fill the sea. And the end, the ultimate goal of Torah in that sense is not the redemption of the Jewish people, but the redemption of the human species. Maimonidean Judaism is not primarily about Jews. Maimonidean Judaism is, in its most fundamental and, and, and clearly stated sense, about the consciousness of the human species. And, and, the, and the, the goal of redemption is not for only for individual Jews, but for all individuals who are capable of understanding the truth. And Raman thinks most people are not capable of understanding the truth. Um, the goal then is for this balance of this, this complex constitution, this complex tradition of sacred literature with these many different layers of meaning, they will provide both guidance to those of the species capable of understanding them and create the political framework for the redemption of the species as a whole. And this is the goal of Jewish religion. Now, all of this we've seen just on the edge of a katsama's leg, what we say in Hebrew, the, on the edge of a fork, standing on one foot. Um, uh, but um, I think in this, we see in this chapter, in Perichelic, um sort of an overview of Rambam's overall theory of religion, 
what we're going to do now is move into these various concepts and ask, what is the universe, as Rambam understands it? What's the structure of reality? Where is God in that picture? What are human beings in that picture? So to start to unpack uh, what, what, kind, what, what characterizes the state of consciousness and the political state that the Rambam is after, and how Torah gets us from here to there. Lee throat.